My name's Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Jeff Regan, investigator, starring Paul Dubov as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's transcribed story, Oil for the Lamps of Burbank. There was a girl in it, a young pretty girl about 19, and her father, a scared little man who couldn't remember the last time he'd had an opinion. There was a boy about the girl's age, and he was dead. And then there was a woman. It all started with a phone call, a simple little five-cent phone call that the lion answered that Friday afternoon. Only what you didn't guess was that the conversation on the other end of the line was more than five cents worth of trouble. Yes, yes, I've got that. Uh, could you speak a little louder, please? Oh, yes, indeed. I'll send a man right out. Hello? Hello? Hmm. Hang up on your fatso? You are, yes. It, Jeffrey, I'm glad you got here. Sounds bad. Oh, Jeffrey, it is bad. That poor man, he, he could hardly get the words out. What's his name, Lion? Uh, name? I don't know. Uh, he talked so softly, I barely understood him. But you said you'd send the man out. Well, I did get the address, Jeffrey. It's in Burbank, 216 North Cordova Street. He told me that before he told me the rest. What's the rest? Well, uh, there's something about his daughter. She's in jail for murder. Uh, then he mentioned someone else. I think it was his wife. He, he wasn't sure. He wasn't sure if she was his wife? Well, he just didn't seem sure of anything. He didn't or you didn't? Now, Jeffrey, you know I always get the facts of the case. Like the client's name? Well... Or why he wanted to hire a private detective? Well... Now, Jeffrey, there were extenuating circumstances. As head of the Lion Detective Agency, I can only do so much. After all, some of the work is up to you. How much is he paying, Fatso? Fifty dollars. You heard that all right. Uh, uh, well, uh, he said that before his voice got so soft. Sure he did, Fatso. He probably repeated it a couple of times. Uh, repeat? Yes, as a matter of fact, he did. Well, don't just stand there, Regan. Get out there and see our client. The lion produced one of his more operatic-type roars, and I left the office. Twenty minutes later, I found 216 North Cordova, a two-story stucco house surrounded by apartments. The street had just been paved, but that didn't stop the rest of the yard from looking like an oversized sandpile. When the door finally opened, a little man, bald and red-eyed, stood peeking at me from behind thick-lensed glasses. He wore a pair of house shoes, an open vest, and a frightened look. You're, uh, you're from the detective agency? My name's Regan. Uh, well, I'm Clarence Andover, Mr. Regan. Uh, pl uh, please come in. I, I'll have to ask you to speak softly, Mr. Regan. My wife is upstairs asleep. Please sit here. My uh, boss said something about your daughter, Mr. Andover. My daughter's in jail, Mr. Regan. I just don't understand. They, they've taken her to jail. When? Uh, last night. They took Dorothy to jail last night. You want to tell me about it, Mr. Andover? But, uh, Mr. Regan, she didn't kill Jimmy Withers. She wouldn't kill anyone. Maybe you better take it from the beginning. Well, uh, the police. Uh, they came here this morning and they told me Dorothy was in jail. They said she'd shot Jimmy. Uh, don't you see, Mr. Regan, Dorothy wouldn't hurt anyone. Jimmy was her boyfriend? Yes, they were, well, almost engaged. Clarence, you see... Uh, are you talking to someone, Clarence? That's my wife, Mr. Regan. Well, Clarence, answer me. When I speak to you, I certainly expect... Oh, you are talking to someone... Well, Clarence, aren't you going to introduce me, or isn't your wife important enough to be introduced to strangers? Uh, yes, dear. Uh, this is Mr. Regan. He's a friend. And how do uh, you do, Mr. Regan? You're selling something, I imagine. How do you, you do, might Mrs. as well Andover? know we aren't interested in buying anything. We certainly can't afford to buy anything on the little money Clarence makes. He should have told you that. Clarence, uh, Mr. Regan shouldn't isn't you selling have told anything, the gentleman Emily. we can't afford to buy... What's that? He isn't selling anything? Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Regan is a private detective, dear. Mr. Regan is a private detective? Clarence, what on earth is a private detective doing here? Haven't we had enough trouble for one day? I called him, Emily. You called him? Well, of uh, all... You explain it, please, Mr. Regan. Clarence, I'm waiting for an explanation. Look, Mrs. Andover, it's about your daughter. Dorothy? <laughs> she most certainly is not my daughter. Uh, my first wife died 15 years ago, Mr. Regan. All right, your husband's daughter, Mrs. Andover. She's in trouble. Your husband figures she needs help. Well, he's certainly right for once in his life. The girl does need help. But I assure you, Mr. Regan, it's not the kind of help that requires a private detective. What that girl needs is spiritual and moral guidance. If Clarence had thought of that sooner, it's just like I always told you, Clarence, that girl would come to no good. You'll bear me witness, I told you so. Uh, yeah, well, well, So, uh, Mr. Regan, if you'll just leave us alone, I'm quite sure we can handle our own problems. Isn't that right, Clarence? Well, Clarence? Uh... Yes, Emily, I, I guess that's right. Well, thank you, Mr. Regan, for coming out. Yeah, we'll get along, I'm sure we'll get along. Won't we, Clarence? Yes, dear, we'll get along. Clarence Andover wanted help. He told the lion he'd pay $50 for a private detective... Only Emily, Clarence's wife, didn't see it that way. I decided to stick with Clarence. I headed my car for the city jail. Okay, five minutes. Dorothy? My name's Jeff Regan. Your father sent me. Daddy? He thinks we might help straighten this out. Then he, he knows. Your father knows you didn't kill Jimmy, Dorothy. But we got to prove that. I knew he'd believe me, Mr. Regan. Daddy believes me. Suppose you tell me what happened. Well, Jimmy and I, we were in his car. We were parked by the side of the road. <laughs> Must I tell it all over again? If you want me to help. They made me tell it so many times, so many times. I know, but try it just once more for me. All right. All right, I'll tell you. We were in Griffith Park, Jimmy and I. We were talking, really, just talking. Go on, Dorothy. Suddenly somebody stuck a gun in the window and shot at us. Jimmy yelled, and, and I yelled, and then... And then I guess I fainted. You didn't see who did it? No, no, I just couldn't see anything. It was so dark, and there was this gun in the window, and, and that's all I remember. When I came to, the police car was there, and they were looking at me, and... What else? The gun was in my hand. The gun that killed Jimmy? Yes, that's what they said. That's all of it? Yes. That's all of it. Tell me about Jimmy. What did he do? Who were his friends, his enemies? He didn't do anything. He used to work for Daddy. Daddy has an electrical appliance store in Burbank. Jimmy used to work there? She made Daddy fire him. Your stepmother. She's awful. I hate her, Mr. Regan. I hate her. Why did she make your father fire Jimmy? Because he stole something. Tell me about that. He and another boy, George Dennison. They robbed the store one night. But Jimmy didn't really mean to do it. He, he brought everything back the next day. He, he just let George talk him into it. Daddy was willing to forgive. But not your stepmother. She took Jimmy to the police. They kept him locked up until he had to tell him who else was with him. So Jimmy told on George. He didn't want to, but they made him. It stands to reason George Dennison might like to get even with Jimmy for that. George had a bad record. When the police found out about him, he was sent to jail. And they let Jimmy go because he brought everything back. But it didn't do any good. What didn't do any good? My stepmother phoned everyone in town and told them not to give Jimmy a job because he was a thief. Is there anyone else who knew Jimmy who believed in him? My uncle. He believed in Jimmy. What's his name? Uncle Peter, Peter Cheney. He's not really my real uncle. He's... He's my stepmother's youngest brother. But he's not like her, really, he isn't. He's, he's a lot younger and he's nice. He, he works for my father, too, and, 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 and he lives with us. Maybe I'll have a talk with him. You'll like him, I'm sure you will. Why don't you give him a chance? He's, he's uh, kind of odd at first. That's only because my stepmother brought him up. Okay, Dorothy, I'll talk to him. Oh, there's, there's one more thing, Mr. Regan. 
I haven't told anybody about that. Yeah. Jimmy and I, we were going to be married tomorrow. <laughs> I checked out front for Lieutenant Sanducci, but they said he wouldn't be in for an hour. That gave me time to run out to Burbank and the girl's father's electrical appliance store. Only when I'd driven halfway out Riverside, I discovered something. Something I didn't expect. Behind me, a gray coupe that had been there since I'd left the jail. I was being followed. But when I pulled up in front of Andover's appliance store on San Fernando Road, the gray coupe was gone. I'm looking for Peter Cheney. Then you've come to the right place. May I show you something in electrical appliances? No, thanks. Fine. If you'll step this way, I'll show you our new home. Exhibit. Suppose we start with your home. Oh, here we... Uh, here we have the latest in coffee makers. With this little gadget, I can... Look, find Cheney, never tell me about Jimmy Withers. A nice boy. Now, here we have a waffle baker. Fully automatic, and it serves four people just... Okay, Cheney, something... now we'll talk my business. Do you think your niece killed that boy? Dorothy Andover is not my niece. She's my sister's husband's child. I know that. Skip technicalities. I think we'd better skip the entire discussion, sir. I don't like your tone of voice. Jimmy Withers was killed at 11 o'clock last night, Cheney. Where were you at the time? I was at home reading, and I have a witness to prove it. Now, crude fellow, get out. That took care of that. Peter Cheney hurried off to another customer, and I walked outside to my car. Then I got another idea. A gray coupe had tailed me to Burbank and then disappeared. But maybe it had pulled over to a stop just before I did. Maybe the gray coupe was waiting for me to get started again. I left my car and walked down the street, then back. No sign of the coupe. Then I moved around the corner and back behind Andover's appliance store. There was a parking lot back there, and there was a gray coupe parked in it. The same car that had tailed me from the jail. 1941 Nash. License plate number 26N99072. But that wasn't what I wanted. What I wanted was inside, wrapped around the steering post in a neat little celluloid folder, the registration card that would tell me who drove the gray coupe. I leaned in, moved it around to where I could get a good look, and... Oh! I never got a chance to find out. It was late afternoon and the sun was slanting behind the ancient brick buildings and there was fog. Fog mixed up with the sunshine and the taste of gravel in my mouth. I was lying in the parking lot behind Andover's appliance store and the fog was in my head. I sat up and looked around. The gray coupe was gone and with it whoever had bent a blackjack over my head. I got up, dusted off my pants, and decided to have a talk with my old pal, Lieutenant Sanducci, so I drove down to police headquarters. Uh, Regan, they tell me you wanted to talk to me. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Sanducci. You look like you don't feel very well. You know, that could be the most honest statement I've heard all day. <sighs> okay, Regan, what's the trouble? The girl you got on a murder rap. Dorothy Andover. Go on. You sure, Sanducci? All the evidence went directly to this girl. But you ask me if I'm sure, and I must tell you the truth. I am not. But you're still holding her. Regan, she was found with a gun in her hand. The boy was sitting beside her dead. What else can I do? Turn her loose and pray for a miracle? Okay, okay. What about the dead boy? He was mixed up in a robbery with another kid about six months ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. I know what you're thinking. The other one's name was George Dennison, the bad one. But you checked him. Of course we checked him. Regan, believe me, there'd been any other way... George I... Dennison had an alibi. Six witnesses, Regan. Six. He spent the evening in a bar. So we have the girl. Ah, there goes your mother, man. What does that mean? What a rotten way to make a living. <laughs> George Dennison, the logical suspect, had six witnesses that he was nowhere near the scene of the crime. But I still wanted to talk to him. 
I went out to a phone booth in the lobby and called my boss, Anthony J. Lyon. The Lyon Detective Agency, Anthony Me, Fatso. J. Jeffrey! What's so surprising about that? Jeffrey, you get up here to my office immediately. Is that clear? Listen, Lyon, I'm in the middle of finding... I don't care what you're in the middle of. You report back to my office at once. And, Regan, if you aren't here in ten minutes, you're fired! Is that clear, Mr. Lyon? I'll sue. I won't have you and your employees disrupting my life. Regan, come here this minute. That's the man. Arrest him. I want this man arrested. Regan, do you know this woman? He most certainly does know me. And if he says he doesn't, then he's lying. Yeah, I know her fast. Now, just a moment, Mrs. Handover. Suppose we hear what Mr. Regan has to say about this. Well, Mr. Regan, what do you have to say about this? About what, Fatso? You know very well about what. Did you or did you not come to my home this afternoon? I did. Did you or did you not hear me say that my husband does not require your services? I heard you say it, Mrs. Handover. Mr. Regan, I will not tolerate your impudence. I told you we were perfectly capable of taking care of ourselves. And let me assure you, I intend proving it. Regan, why didn't you tell me Mrs. Handover had fired you off the case? So you're lying to your employer. Yes, of course. Shut up, both of you. Now, suppose somebody tells me just what the complaint is. Well, Regan, you had no right you had no right to investigate the private lives of my family. The very idea of your questioning my brother. Oh, so that's it. That most certainly is it. Peter phoned me that a man had been in the store questioning him. And I knew immediately that you would be just such a person. Well, I'm going to put a stop to it. You all through, Mrs. Handover? You too, Fatso? Uh, Okay, then I'm going to tell you something, both of you. There's a girl sitting down there in a jail cell. She's charged with murder. Well, I don't think she killed Jimmy Withers. I think she's telling the truth, and I'm going to find out one way or another. I'm going to find out. And you, Mrs. Andover, or you, Lyon, aren't going to stop me. Have I made myself clear? Just stay out of my way. There was one visit left to make. One more place to add facts. I phoned Lieutenant Sanducci down at headquarters and got the address. Then I drove out. Boyle Heights, Wilmot Street, four-family flat. And out in front, out front of the four-family flat was parked a gray coupe. A gray coupe, 1941 Nash, license number 26N99072. I moved faster. Yeah. I think you and me are going to have a talk. He ain't home. You're home, Dennison. You left your car parked out front. What's it to you, Flatfoot? Your memory's not that short, George. Move over. That's better, George. Now, suppose we talk about a robbery. You trying to frame me, Shamus? A job you pulled about six months ago. You and a kid named Jimmy Withers. Get lost. Think, George. I may be here all night. No, no. You got the wrong guy, all right. Jimmy stooled on you the next day. You remember that, George? You were sore, real sore. Jimmy not only stooled, he took back the stuff you'd stolen. <coughs> Oh, you don't, Shamus. Not anymore, you don't. Oh, George has a gun now. Well, put it down. Stay right there. We can add gun without permits. We ain't gonna add nothing, Shamus. Not assault or battery or nothing. Stand back. We'll add plenty. Now, let's not waste any more time. Leave me alone. Who killed Jimmy Withers? I don't know. Why did you rob Andover's store? Yeah, it was his idea. He had the combination of the safe. Jimmy was just a clerk. They don't give clerks the numbers to the safe. He, he got it somewhere. He had inside dope. He told you that? Yeah, yeah. He wanted me to plan it. Then why did he squeal? Because of the girl, he said. Because he was in love with some girl. Finish it. He, he was afraid he'd lose the girl. She had other boyfriends? I don't know. I don't know. Why did you tell me, George? Why did you sap me? I... I was down at the jail. They had me for questioning. I saw you leave Santucci's office. I figured you were trying to frame me. You were going to make trouble. You made your own trouble, George. Plenty of it. You're going to frame me for that murder rap, Shamus? Just for assault, for carrying a gun without a permit, for trying to use it. You framed yourself. I called the police and waited for a squad car to pick up George Dennison. They came and went, and I drove back through town toward Burbank. Yes? Oh, oh, Mr. Regan. Mind if I come in, Clarence? Well, uh, well, I wouldn't mind, Mr. Regan, but you see, uh, that is, uh, my wife is upstairs. She wouldn't care much for the idea, that it? Well, I, I wouldn't say exactly it's that. It's okay, Clarence, I'll say it. Besides, your wife's the one I want to see. Uh, well, 
if you say so, Mr. Regan, I suppose... Thanks. You know, but, uh, I- I'll tell Emily you... Just I- a minute, Clarence. I want to ask you one question first. Uh, very well, Mr. Regan. Last night when Jimmy Withers was shot, were you at home? No. No, 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 I wasn't. I, I was at a lodge meeting until midnight. You see, Emily said... There was I... just Emily and her brother, Peter. Uh, why, yes. We can talk about it later. Suppose you call your wife. The nervous little man shuffled up the stairs rather than raise his voice to call Emily. Glanced back at me once, unsure, worried, then moved up to the second floor. There were voices up there for a few minutes, and then down the stairs came Emily Andover. Emily, in all her bombastic glory, a house coat wrapped around her big frame, hairpins holding down a mass of twisted ringlets. Emily the Queen, hand it for a crown. Well, Mr. Regan... And what excuse are you giving for barging into my home again, meddling into my affairs? Uh, Mr. Regan, You stay I out of think... this, Clarence. What I've got to say is for your wife. Mrs. Andover, you spent the evening at home last night? <laughs> yes, I did. Your brother, he was here with you? Yes, he was. All evening? Mr. Regan, I'm going to call the police. I said all evening? Oh, well, yes. But you're not sure? Yes, yes, I'm sure. You sat here all evening with Peter? What is the meaning of this, Mr. Regan? Are you trying to imply that I lied to the police? Yes. Well, uh, oh, Mr. Regan, you shouldn't say a thing a like A boy that. was murdered last night, uh, Mrs. Handover. Your husband's daughter's in jail for that murder. Sure, she's not your flesh and blood. She's your stepdaughter. But Peter Cheney is. He's your flesh and blood brother. He's yours. Mr. Regan, Yet I you'd lie don't... for what's yours and let another man's daughter die for a murder she didn't commit. That's not true. It's not true. It isn't? You don't believe in murder, do you, Mrs. Andover? Murder is wrong, but you provided an alibi for a murderer. No. Peter Cheney, your brother, shot and killed Jimmy Withers. Shot and killed him because Jimmy was about to take Dorothy away, because Jimmy was about to marry her. No. No, that's a lie. Peter Cheney followed them to Griffith Park. He shot Jimmy Withers, he returned to the house, and you provided the alibi for him. No, no, he wouldn't do a thing like that. Peter wouldn't. He couldn't. He wasn't do it. home with you all evening. No, no, he wasn't. He went out about ten or ten thirty. Came back maybe thirty minutes or so later. Yes, yes, he did. But Peter wouldn't kill anyone. I know he wouldn't. He's my brother. He's. Thank you for defending me, Emily. Peter. Mr. Regan is lying, Emily. You and I both know that. But Peter, that that gun. Well, Mr. Regan talks too much, my dear. We wouldn't want some of those lies spread around the neighborhood, would we? Or to the police, Cheney. We wouldn't want them spread there. Precisely, Mr. Regan. Just the way I feel about it. Peter, what... what Mr. Regan says... Emily, you shouldn't have admitted to Mr. Regan that I left the house last night. That was quite wrong of you. But, Peter, I... You did... didn't know you'd lied for a murderer, Mrs. Andover. You didn't know because he happened to be your brother? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Regan, I don't like what you're doing at all. You're undermining my sister's faith in me. <gasps> to say nothing of my dear brother-in-law. Is that right, Clarence? Don't talk to me. You see, Mr. Regan? <laughs> my sister crying and my brother-in-law trying to act like a man again. Terrible what you're doing. Like you did to Jimmy Withers. You gave him the combination to the store safe. You encouraged him to pull off a robbery so you could turn on him, have him arrested, and have Dorothy for yourself. How did I know Jimmy was going to bring everything back the next morning? When George Dennison told me Jimmy had inside dope, it began to make sense. George also told me Jimmy was afraid of losing his girl, Dorothy. A lovely girl. Dorothy's quite fond of me, you know. So she told me in her jail cell this morning. When I added the robbery and the other man Jimmy was afraid of, it had to be you. You wanted Dorothy, but you'd let her go to prison for your crime. Oh, but I was sure George Dennison would be arrested. He'd been caught stealing in the neighborhood before. He hated Jimmy, and he had a prison record. Naturally, I was, I was quite shocked when he turned up with such a good alibi. You're hateful. Hateful! Sister, dear, that's no way to act. After all, you are an accomplice. And then, too, we must kill Mr. Regan before he brings ruin on both of us. No. You mean you aren't going to supply me with another alibi? Emily, dear, don't forget, you have to save your own skin. No. No, I won't do it. I don't care what they do with me. I don't care. Even Emily, Peter. (laughs) And you, Clarence? Surely you don't want to see poor Emily in prison. I want to kill you. Clarence, stay right where you are. I've hated you from the first moment you set foot in my house. From the moment I first saw you looking at my daughter. 
I listened, Emily. I gave you a job. I supported Clarence. you. Clarence. I am not going to listen to Emily any longer, Brother Peter. I am not going to let you and your sister destroy what's left Just of my life. Stop him, Clarence! <laughs> All right, Peter, I'll take that gun. No, no, yes! No. Uh, uh, Clarence, you all right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yes, Mr. Regan. You... You saved my life. I oh, know. Not me, Clarence. For once, you... You saved your own life. Lieutenant Sanducci showed up for the prisoner, Peter Cheney, and with him went his sister, Emily. It made sense that Emily wouldn't get off scot-free for lying to the cops, but Peter, he could plan nothing less than life. Clarence Andover watched them go, and the look in his eyes gave the whole thing more meaning. Clarence didn't need either of them anymore. Even my boss, Anthony J. Lyon, was happy when I showed up for work the next morning. Yep. Spring color, the flowers, Jeffrey. Happy today, huh, Lion? Uh, well, uh, uh, not especially, Jeffrey, not especially. Funny, you sounded to me like a guy who just received a check. A check? Well, why, how ridiculous. Jeffrey, who told you? Clarence Andover. He said he was mailing the fee to the office last night. He did? Oh, the fee. Yes, 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 he mailed the fee. Just like I said, $50. Very kind of him, I'm sure. $50. Yes, yes, Jeffrey. I uh, I deposited his check at the bank this morning. Well, I'd have saved it to show to you, but you see, I wanted to get to the bank early. Avoid the rush. You understand. Oh, sure. I understand. Uh, banks are crowded these days. If I'd gotten there any later, why, why, why even as it was, Jeffrey, the line was have... Way down to the next counter. Fifty dollars, huh, Fatso? Well, uh, Jeffrey, there was a small bonus included. Uh, Mr. Andover just enclosed a little something to buy a new doormat. <laughs> you know, Lion, one hundred dollars will buy a lot of doormats. Yeah, one hundred dollars? Who told you? That Clarence Andover added another fifty because we saved his daughter? Well, now, Fatso... Oh, it... very well, Jeffrey. A hundred dollars is in the bank. You get your share. Well, thanks, Fatso. I already have. What? I was at the bank this morning, standing in line right behind you. Jeffrey! <laughs> Jeff Regan, Investigator, is written by William Frug, produced and directed by Sterling Tracy, and stars Paul Dubov as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Dick Arant. Bob Stevenson speaking, inviting you to be with us again for more transcribed suspense and mystery and adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator.